From Forest Floor to Canopy, a guide to birds of the eastern deciduous forest. From the ground to the treetops. Are you a teacher or bird club program presenter? You can download a Jeopardy game to play after this video. Find the link in the video's description below. Learn about the brown colored birds found in the forest floor and shrubs, the green colored birds in the understory, and the colorful birds of the canopy. You will also discover birds found on the tree trunks and branches at all levels. All birds shown are found in the eastern United States. Most birds were filmed in the Maryland area. Before we move on, I want to show you ways birds avoid being a meal for a predator. Birds, like this downy woodpecker, are constantly scanning their surroundings for danger. The avian population is very wary, including these wood ducks. Our feathered friends will quickly scoot away or fly away if you get too close. Canadian geese lay many eggs that hatch out into many goslings. Unfortunately, many of these goslings will be eaten by such predators as gray blue herons and alligators. Often colorful and found in all levels of the forest, warblers such as this male American redstart are skittish, quickly moving birds, difficult for a hawk to capture. Female warblers tend to be more subdued and camouflaged on the nest. Let's delve a little further into bird camouflage. During World War II, this spider plane was countershaded to reduce its likelihood of being spotted by the enemy. The top of the plane is dark, making it less likely to be spotted from above. An enemy pilot would have a harder time seeing the plane from below with its white shade blending with the sky. This eastern Phoebe has a white belly, like the sky. A red-eyed vireo's green back enables it to blend in with the leaves, making it less likely to be spotted by a hawk from above. Birds on the forest floor, such as the eastern towhee, psalm sparrow, and oven bird, blend in with the leaves. In the understory, the eastern phoebe and least flycatcher are greenish to avoid capture, as they often perch to catch flies midair. There's always an exception to any rule. The vermilion flycatcher is very showy with its bright red plumage. Among the foliage, you'll find vireos feasting on caterpillars, each preferring their own niche. Yellow-throated vireos are colorful, but high in the canopy, far from ground-based predators. Leafy-colored red-eyed vireos singing throughout the day are active in the understory. The white-eyed vireo with tinges of yellow can hide in a thicket when predators are nearby. The warbling vireo, warbling loudly, are also greenish and common in riparian trees. Let's visit the forest floor now. With its brown back and speckled belly, the wood thrush is very camouflaged sitting on this rotten stump. Wood thrushes kick and turn leaves and dig into the soil to find invertebrates such as beetles, caterpillars, spiders, and ants. This wood thrush is wrestling with a worm. Years ago, when I worked at a scout camp, the early morning flute-like song of the wood thrush heard from my tent was my alarm clock. The eastern towhee, like the wood thrush, also kicks and scrapes the ground for invertebrates. However, this red-eyed bird prefers thickets or brushy woodland, often near openings. The bird seems to say, drink your tea. The Carolina wren is a very common bird rummaging through the dead leaves and in the brambles of our forests. This one is perched next to a poison ivy vine. It seems to say, Tweedalo, Tweedalo, Tweedalo. <whistles> you put water in a bird whistle to create a bubbly bird song. The house wren is common in shrubs and tangles, singing a similar song. Its song sounds like a bubbly bird whistle. The oven bird feeds on insects, mostly at ground level. It looks like a miniature wood thrush. However, this bird has a black bordered orange stripe on its crown, a white eye ring, and a bobbing tail. Oven birds are named for their oven-like dome-shaped nest found on the ground with a side entrance. Let's look at birds that frequent the underbrush to protect themselves from predators. The white-eyed vireo with its white iris and black pupil is found in brushy areas and around sticker bushes. 
Here is a chattering white-eyed vireo carrying a moth for its nestlings. The bird song can be described as chip a -zeer, chip. This male cardinal is singing loudly to establish its territory. Cardinals are often seen in low brushy areas. This female is perched on a spice bush. Years ago, European settlers named the bird because it reminded them of the red vestments of the Catholic cardinal. 90% of this bird's diet, other than insects, is weed seeds, grains, and fruits. This cardinal is feeding on rose hips of the multiflora rose. After the outer coat of the hip is digested, the seeds will go through the bird's digestive tract to be defecated and fall to the ground. Some of the seeds will germinate and grow, helping to spread this invasive sticker bush. Another common bird in early stages of forest growth is the gray catbird. Catbirds are mostly gray with a black cap and red undertail coverts. The catbird's call sounds just like a cat. The common yellowthroat's call note sounds like a rubber band being twanged. The song can be described as witchity, witchity, witchity. The male bird has a black mask. Yellowthroats are found in brushy or marshy vegetation near water. The female lacks the black mask. The white-throated sparrow, a male seen here, is a very common ground and shrub bird in Maryland from mid-October to late April. The bird's summer breeding area is shown in red on this range map. The blue area is the winter range of the white-throated sparrow. The white throat song resembles the phrase, Long live Canada, Canada, Canada. On a snowy day, I came upon a white-throated sparrow kicking dirt to uncover seeds in any stages of insects it could find. Listen to the beautiful melody of a song sparrow. Song sparrows live in Maryland year-round, as indicated by the purple on this map. Another kind of sparrow, the dark-eyed junco, formerly aptly named the slate-colored junco, it migrates down to Maryland to spend the winter. It seems to bring the snow, hence the name snowbird, with a belly white as snow. The dark-eyed junco has a very musical, liquid trill. In streams flowing through forested areas, you may come upon a Louisiana water thrush. This bird wades and swims in the clean waters to feed on aquatic insects, such as mayflies and stoneflies. A stream with Louisiana water thrushes is often a good place to catch a trout. Both the bird and the fish feed on mayflies and stoneflies found in clean streams. Water thrushes singing at dusk have a loud ringing song. Nashville warblers breed in the north woods and stop by our forest in the fall on the way to the tropics. This one is taking a bath in a small woodland stream. A black-throated green warbler, a coniferous forest nester, is also migrating and stopping to take a dip. It's on its way to Central America. It is very energetic as it pops up and down. We will now take a look at the birds between the forest floor and shrub layer and the canopy layer, a forest layer we call the understory. If you are quiet and observant, you may be able to find a yellow-billed cuckoo in the understory. Yellow-billed cuckoos are commonly found where tent caterpillars are numerous. This cuckoo has a white spot on the ends of each of its long outer tail feathers. Oh, look! A cuckoo has just captured a praying mantis. The Phoebe is a tail-wagging flycatcher. Phoebes arrive in my state of Maryland as early as March, as you can see from this eBird bar chart. The Phoebe calls out its own name. A Phoebe with a beak full of insects. It is ready to feed two young in a nest plastered to the concrete wall underneath a road bridge. I found this Phoebe feeding its young underneath another bridge. Here is an eastern wood peewee scanning for insects on a perch. It will fly from the perch to grab an insect midair. This is called hawking or sally gleaning for insects. Let's watch! 
Eastern wood peewees nest in the eastern United States during our summer when insects are plentiful enough to feed their young. They then migrate to South America for the winter season. Peewees and other flycatchers capture more than just flies. Shown here is the wide variety of prey that flycatchers will grab in midair or grasp from a leaf or branch. Researchers in the state of Virginia found that flycatchers divide up the habitat when hunting. This relationship is called resource partitioning. Least flycatchers commonly captured insects from a perch 8 meters from the ground. The eastern wood peewee's preferred perch was at 11 meters. The gray-crested flycatcher was seen most often hunting from a branch 16 meters up. Look! In the box elder tree, I see an Acadian flycatcher. This flycatcher is from the genus Impidonax. The word Impidonax is from the Greek word for mosquito king. Impidonax flycatchers look alike. They all have an olive green color with a thin eye ring. Birds of this genus can be separated by call and habitat. The Acadian flycatcher's call resembles the sound kerchip. Acadian flycatchers are common in streamside woodlands. Here is another Impidonax, a willow flycatcher, named for its preference for nesting in willow trees. Willow flycatchers can be identified by its Fitzboo call. Of course, flying insects above the forest and in nearby fields never get a rest. Barn swallows swoop through the air to capture insect prey. Look at these barn swallows feeding their young like an acrobat. This tree swallow zooms in and hovers to feed its young. And what about these rough winged swallows? There's a blue-headed vireo in the understory. Will it find a caterpillar? Yes, it found one. It is taking it up to the next branch. These birds consume many butterfly and moth larvae. Here is a red-eyed vireo. This is one of the most common forest birds. Its green color blends in with the understory. It just swallowed a wasp. Red-eyed vireos glean branches and leaves for insects, especially caterpillars. The red-eyed vireo's caterpillar diet changes throughout the year. 15% caterpillars are grazed in the spring. It goes up to 50% caterpillars during the summer. 20% caterpillars in the fall as it switches to a more fruit diet. In the vireo's winter range, mostly fruit are eaten. Red-eyed vireo sing throughout the day, whistling a cheery, I'm here, can't you see me? I'm here. From summer to fall. The cedar waxwings are now feeding on rose hips. Throughout the understory, golden and ruby crowned kinglets, wintering in Maryland, feed on insects and insect eggs. This ruby crowned kinglet is hovering to capture insects on seed pods. Year round residents, tufted titmice are great at feeding on caterpillars. Carolina chickadees will glean the branches and leaves and look for insects and insect eggs throughout the winter time. Let's go to the treetops and learn about birds that live in the canopy. It is now the month of May in Maryland. Look up in the trees. The scarlet tanager has arrived after wintering in South America. This vivid red bird is a welcome summer breeder who likes to spend much time in the treetops. The female is greenish-yellow. This bird has a steady diet of caterpillars high up in the trees. It prefers forests with white oak trees. This is the 1921 Baltimore Orioles baseball team. Way up high in a walnut tree is the bird that is on the baseball cap, a Baltimore Oriole. You will hear an Oriole's piping notes before you see him. The female oriole builds a woven pouch nest hanging from the ends of branches 25 to 30 feet high in a tree. Audubon's painting places the hanging basket nest in a tulip tree. This warbler has a rising trill that drops at the end. 
Walk on a trail that is along the forested Gunpowder River and you might see a northern parallel warbler in the canopy. It does go low. This one was filmed at eye level. Every summer I look forward to seeing the indigo bunnings singing from the top of a tree at the edge of a field. The song of the male bird is a high-pitched buzzed sweet, 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 choo, choo, sweet, sweet, lasting two to four seconds, sung to mark his territory to other males and to attract females. This is a red-shouldered hawk. It appears to have what looks like half-moon-shaped translucent windows in the primary feathers that are easily observed on a sunny day. This adult red-shouldered hawk was filmed right outside my kitchen window, sitting on an oak tree. This raptor hunts from a perch. It will dive down quickly to capture a chipmunk or snake. It has been recorded to have snatched an occasional starling or dove from beneath the bird feeder. I found this red-tailed hawk sitting in a tree at Oregon Ridge Park. Red-tailed hawks are beauties with wings that have much surface area and fan-shaped tails for gliding high in the air. Buteos soar on thermals, which are columns of warm air that rise high as a mile. Red-tailed hawks are lifted upward by the thermals and ride from one thermal to the next. Look at this red-tailed hawk flying on a thermal. This cauldron of juvenile Cooper's hawks was filmed in a residential community. Cooper's hawks are bird hawks called occipiters with long tails. They can maneuver through the forest to capture small birds. They also prey on birds at bird feeders. Birds and many rodents probably do not sleep soundly when the barred owl is on the prowl. This barred owl is being mobbed by robins. What's that bird climbing up the tree? Let's examine birds climbing on tree trunks and branches. And sometimes even electric utility poles. White-breasted nuthatches are common year-round residents in deciduous forests. They are often seen creeping upside down on tree trunks and branches, searching for insects, adults, larvae, and eggs. Nuthatches also like to store seeds. This one remembers where it placed a sunflower seed. Oh wow, I see a brown creeper. It is a small bird that creeps up a tree trunk to suck up insect eggs and larvae found in the crevices of the bark with its curved bill. Woodpeckers, such as this downy woodpecker, prevent insect populations from getting out of hand in woodlands. With their stiff tail and zygodactyl feet, two toes facing forward and two toes facing back, they prop themselves on tree trunks, constantly pecking as they drill for wood-boring insects, such as beetle larvae and carpenter ants. The downy has a short pinprick bill. This is a hairy woodpecker. As you can see, its bill is much longer, and the bird is considerably bigger than the downy woodpecker. Oh, wow! Are those birds ivory-billed woodpeckers? No, you are looking at a pair of pileated woodpeckers. This species is now more common than a hundred years ago in areas where the forests have returned. In contrast, the now extinct ivory-billed woodpecker, due to overhunting and habitat loss, is extinct. This bird is common in moist woodlands that include large trees. Pileated woodpeckers dig into trees with their chisel-sharp beaks and with a sticky barbed tongue extract carpenter ants and beetle larvae. You might come upon a pileated woodpecker feeding on carpenter ants found on a rotten log or stump. In Maryland, I look forward to seeing yellow-bellied sapsuckers in the wintertime. The orange areas on this North America map shows the sapsuckers breeding range. The blue areas represent the bird's winter range. The holes that the sapsucker drills are called sap wells. The sapsucker will sip sap and also find insects to eat in the sap wells. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers visit several trees to maintain the sap wells. Many species of birds visit the wells to sip sap including the downy woodpecker and white-breasted nuthatch. Did you know that the ruby-throated hummingbird will often build its nest close to sap wells to sip sap? Thank you for watching this video about birds at different forest lairs. You can learn all about birds by visiting my YouTube channel. Please subscribe!
This is an amazingly beautiful bird called a hooded warbler. Unfortunately, a house cat killed this hooded warbler. According to the American Bird Conservancy, approximately 2.4 billion birds are killed by house cats in the United States alone. So please, keep cats inside so birds live. <laughs>